Good morning and welcome to the Deanery Garden at Canterbury Cathedral on this Tuesday the 29th of March. The month is almost over but uh, feel welcome wherever you are in the world to join us in our prayers and bring your own concerns, your own pictures of distress or happiness and joy from across the world to join in with this act of worship. We continue, of course, to hold the people of Ukraine in our prayers and all those who can influence that situation for good and for reconciliation and for a, a, a peace which is just and right for the peoples there. And that, of course, is a, an undergirding of that situation with our prayers right across the world. But you will have other prayers. There are many people who are in serious lockdown. We think of the uh, lockdown in Shanghai, for example, with the pandemic, which is still very much a feature of danger for our humankind at the moment. But all these things tend to focus our planet together as one family. And we, today, right across the world, say our prayers for that one family in this beautiful creation which the Creator has given us. We pray for a right use of that. Now I've come to a special place in the garden and I'm feeling that special place because my seat is rocking and you'll guess that I'm sitting on the swing underneath the ash tree on the south side of the garden. We quite often have sat by the massive trunk of the ash tree on the north side of the garden and here I am with this one. I would say just a little bit younger but nevertheless a strong tree with its branches spreading out and me uh, swinging from one of the branches on this swing which was given to us by two of our friends, uh, Nancy and Andy Mead, uh, living in Rhode Island now but I'm enjoying the gift that they gave us as I'm speaking to you. There's a sense of relaxation always sitting on a swing. But the branch I'm sitting on is strong and yet the ash trees throughout these islands are threatened by ash dieback disease and we fear for them. And we'll speak a little bit about that in our reflection also. But for the moment let's begin our morning prayers on this Tuesday the 29th of March under a grey sky but a perfectly still day with no cold air about it and we see the scenes around us of the beginning of the dying back of the daffodils, the yellow flowers there, but it's hard actually to walk across the lawn even to this place and not tread on wild flowers which are popping up absolutely everywhere. And as we came across this morning, Flesher had to keep saying, mind your foot, mind your foot, because there are little flowers everywhere <laughs> popping up amongst the grasses. I can see from here fritillaries and cowslips and a, a most beautiful dark purple primula, uh, uh, primula here uh, and some grape piles and well, lots of things and bluebell leaves, of course, are plenty. They will come later. Primroses uh, and all the things that we have been enjoying looking at with the Viper's Bugloss with its beautiful blue and other things which will come to us with their scents as well as their colour. Let's say our prayers on this day. O Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Hear our voice, O Lord, according to your faithful love. According to your judgment, give us life. Blessed are you, God of compassion and mercy. To you be praise and glory forever. In the darkness of our sin, your light breaks forth like the dawn, and your healing springs up for deliverance. As we rejoice in the gift of your saving help, sustain us with your bountiful spirit, and open our lips to sing your praise. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. The night has passed, and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. And as we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. One of the great pleasures of the 29th day of the month is in the reading of the psalm, Psalm 139. 
for this morning of the month. O oh Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You mark out my journeys and my resting place and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but you, O oh Lord, know it altogether. You encompass me behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go then from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I climb up to heaven, you are there. If I go down into hell, you are there also. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand hold me fast. If I say, peradventure the darkness will cover me, and the light around me turn to night, even darkness is no darkness with you. The night is as clear as the day. Darkness and light to you are both alike. For you yourself created my inmost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I thank you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are your works. My soul knows well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my form as yet unfinished, Already in your book were all my members written, as day by day they were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How deep are your counsels to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I count them, they are more in number than the sand, and at the end I am still in your presence. Search me out, O God, and know my heart. Try me and examine my thoughts. See if there is any way of wickedness in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. A beautiful psalm of God's knowledge of us, and really reflections of things like the prophet Jonah, who fled across the sea and into the deeps to escape the presence of God and what God had in store for him as his particular Jonah-like vocation. And yet, as we know, wherever he went, he could not escape God. But better still, that sense of climbing up to heaven or going down to hell and still being in the presence of God and that going down to hell can sometimes happen in the course of human life. How often have we said, I was heard people say, I was in hell at that time, and yet God's presence is absolutely there with them to be perceived. So we're going to go back now to our reading from the Gospel of St John, and today we're starting chapter 10. Chapter 10 is a really favourite chapter for so many and it splits itself into quite short sections because the images which Jesus is, uh, is using about himself, those images are each so powerful that the I am statements come thick and fast and we need to savour each one and let that sign of the I am presence of Christ infiltrate our whole being, body, mind and spirit, and be thought out and prayed out and pondered in silence in order that we can really get the full quality different as we grow older and older through life, different every time we read it. But chapter 10 of St John's Gospel needs constant reflection. So here I am beginning 
with verse 1, which begins with the statement of Jesus, which always means, now listen hard. Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that one is a thief and a robber. But the one who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, they will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And there at verse 10, we'll stop for today. As I say, each of the images deserves pondering in a good way. And today's image is not only of Jesus as the door, but of Jesus as the shepherd. Now that image is given full power when we carry on tomorrow. But for the moment, we're thinking of the door of the sheepfold and the way in which that access is through the words and the, uh, that Jesus is speaking and the life that Jesus is living as one of us, the Word made flesh. And still notice at the end of that first paragraph, which ends at verse 6, the evangelist writes, This figure of speech Jesus used with them, that, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Why? Because of course he's still working on the two planes. And we've seen how difficult it is for us, who are people of flesh and blood, to enter not just through thinking, but through a spiritual reflection into that world of the Spirit. Good morning, Mr. Robin. Here you are. You found us. You always do. Wherever we come in the garden, here you are on a bell twig. And I can't ever escape your beady eye on me. And we're really glad to have you with us. So, we have that little paragraph to begin with. And those that Jesus are speaking to, those just not understanding. So he tries again. We do this in sermons. I always look down from the pulpit and see if people are listening. That's why I hate using scripts. Because rather like someone who drops a stitch in knitting, you can see if the image that you are using is actually being understood by the particular people you have in front of you. And first of all, you have to judge what kind of people you have in front of you, of course, because they will be interested in different things. We use it to on candlelit pilgrimages. If we go around the cathedral in the evening, different people, different groups are interested in different things. And you see it by their faces, and you see it even from the high pulpit of Canterbury Cathedral with a full nave. You're looking round, and body language will tell you if the image you've just used is being understood or is puzzling the people. And if it is, well then, what do you do? You go back, pick up the stitch, and use another image which might be more relevant to them. And here's Jesus doing exactly the same thing with his words. So Jesus again said to them, 
truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. There's our I am statement for this morning. I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. The sheep did not listen to them. And the sense of Jesus knowing the sheep by name spreads out in this gospel in a great way. We've said how very often people are not named in this gospel. I think quite often so that you might think it's you or me that Jesus is talking to in the words that he is saying to an unnamed person like the woman at the well. But at the same time, when people are named, it's very often a sign of the affection that Jesus has for them and certainly the knowledge not only of their uh, physicality and the way they present themselves but deeply, this is like our psalm this morning, that the Lord knows us inside out from top to bottom and in body, mind and spirit. There is no hiding and that name calls. And of course there will be significant moments in this gospel, particularly in the resurrection narrative, when Jesus uses the name, calling his sheep by name, and there is recognition. Mary, Rabboni, wonder and joy. Or Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Three times the name and three times an answer expected. Not so uh, much a sense of unreserved gladness, but a sense of first nervousness, then receiving forgiveness, and then a sense of almost desperation when Peter finally says, Lord, you know everything. That's, that's the truth. Jesus already knows, but he wants the answer from the one he's named. And here we have it in this lovely image. The sheep go in and out and find pasture, but then the sense of, I know my own, and I call them by name. And that following of the shepherd becomes part of this particular image. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He is also an image which is, which is coming. If the sheep are in danger, and the sheep are very much in danger of, of the sin which besets them on every side, and also their lack of understanding, then from those dangers around them, and from the sins that beset them, the shepherd is willing even to give up his own life. I am the good shepherd, we shall read tomorrow. But for today, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Or earlier on, the sheep hear the shepherd's voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He doesn't follow them, he leads them. And they follow gladly because they trust the shepherd who knows them inside out. And that following means that Jesus has already trod the path that he's calling us to, tro to tread, each one a different way, but nevertheless Jesus himself has walked that human way before. Well then we come to verse 10, and this I may have said before, it's difficult over the two years to remember what I have spoken to you about and what I haven't, but this John chapter 10 and verse 10 reminds me so much of John Oliver, who was the Bishop of Hereford all the time I was Dean of Hereford through those years. And uh, I remember that uh, shared ministry with enormous thanksgiving, John and Meriel, his wife, dear friends, and their family too. But John always had a way when he was taking confirmations of saying to those he confirmed, remember the numbers 1010. 10. 
at that time it was also a fizzy drink, I don't know if it still is, but uh, the, the children and the young people knew it, as did the adults, 10-10. And then they'd look puzzled, and he'd say, and then turn to the fourth gospel, chapter 10, verse 10, and remember that and read it. I came that you might have life, and have it in all its fullness. The word used in this translation is abundantly. You can use it how you like. All its fruitfulness, all the flowering of your particular creative gifts, all those things, I came that you might have life and have it in abundance. 10.10 10 in John's Gospel. And then he would say to the confirmation candidates, now whenever you see me around the diocese, and he'd talk about agricultural shows, because Hereford was very much a farming diocese, and South Shropshire the same. Wherever you see me, maybe we pass each other in one of the little towns of, of South Shropshire. Then touch my sleeve and say, Bishop, 1010, and I shall know that you've remembered that verse, which is one of the most crucial verses in the whole of the New Testament. I came that you might have life in all its abundance, in all its fruitfulness, in all its glory, in fulfilment of the gifts that you've been given, particularly your own, as the psalmist says in that long and beautiful psalm this morning. Hello, Tiger, you've come now. Are you coming over here? <laughs> I think he'll come across in a moment. So, I want you to mention this morning two particular dates and yeah, really it's, it's one of them, the reasons that I'm sitting under this ash tree. And uh, as we mention them, I'm thinking of two particular people. First of all, this is the day in, on the 29th of March, 1788, when Charles Wesley died, aged 80. He'd been born in 1707 and he had um, been a, a, a great scholar in his youth, so that he had great learning, and his older brother John and he set off to across the Atlantic to the most beautiful city, you'll know this if you, if you uh, have ever been there, of Savannah in Georgia. And uh, that is a, a, a city which still has a statue of John Wesley there from the ministry that took place there. Charles was there a short time but he came back to England and never crossed the Atlantic again but in 1738 like his brother John he had an experience he was already a deeply devout person but he had an experience which was life-changing, an experience of the Spirit, which, which caused him to know his own vocation even better. And we ask, first of all, how do we know him now? And we know him best, of course, as a hymn writer. And that knowing him is something that we know through singing his hymns. But at the same time, I know of him and his brother John and George Whitfield by the fact that because of their, shall we say, dynamic preaching, which is a word which means powerful preaching, a preaching of power, they became not welcome in the parish churches of others and church wardens would say you're stirring up the people too much and so what did they do? Well they took to the fields and began to preach in the fields to people who really had no concept of entering a church. They'd have been too embarrassed even to enter the church. You want to come up here? Um, and as they did so, I don't think that's going to work for you, Tiger, is it, this morning? Should we put that on the floor? Is that the best thing? Or over here, maybe? Hey, eh? Didn't want to. Just do it. I'll put it this side. Yeah, let's do this. We know our creatures and we know them by name. Here we are. Come over here. In dead said, that's better still. Here we are, Tiger. Hey, come up here. Up. That's better. Good boy. Um, so, I'm thinking back now 
to my childhood. My bedroom here in the deanery, uh, which I can see from where I'm sitting, looks out to the sunrise and to the moonrise as well. It's spoiled these days by great sodium lights of Christchurch University on the, on the hill. But when I came here first, it was a perfect sunrise, a perfect uh, moonrise. But my bedroom at home in the mornings were, was facing not the sunrise, but in the evening were facing the sunset. And from that window, and it was one of the smallest of the rooms in the house, I would look out not only to the sunset, but at certain times of year to the planet Venus, which I used to call my star. And Father, when he came to say prayers, uh, would always look out and if Venus wasn't shining, he would say, good night in Welsh, no star. About the only Welsh, <laughs> Welsh words he knew. <laughs> but we used to have that as a joke between us that if the star was not shining, Father would say, no star. And at the end of that, um, another light was shining too. But I could only see that through the branches of a great ash tree, which stood between me and this distant light. And in wintertime, of course, I saw it quite clearly all the time. It was always there, not like the planet Venus, it was always there. And that light was a beacon which had been erected on a site where Charles and John Wesley and George Whitfield spoke to a multitude of coal miners who were around at that time in the 18th century uh, mining coal in, in the forests around, the Kingswood Forest which spread all over and beyond that I could see the, city, the lights of the city of Bristol just a glow. If we looked out on the other side of the house we would see the Kelston tump of trees and the city of Bath's glow but city of Bristol that way. And that beacon was actually a sign of Charles Wesley and John Wesley choosing to preach in the fields and finding there a fit place as we do in the garden and many signs of what to say about our Lord's message. I give thanks for that and think of it quite often, but I give thanks even more for Charles Wesley's hymns. For he wrote, can you believe this, at least 6,500 hymns, we know that for a fact, but it's estimated he probably wrote almost 10,000 hymns. He was a complete flood of hymnody in words and that sense of, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly, fruitfulness, no one showed that more than Charles Wesley in beautiful hymns. We could think of so many of them. And we think of love divine, all loves excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. The one I wanted to read a couple of verses from this morning is also a hymn about the gifts of the Spirit. For Wesley, probably his, his most popular hymn, And Can It Be That I Should Gain an Interest in My Saviour's Love, talks about feeling a total sense of freedom once that gift has been accepted. My chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth and followed thee, following the shepherd along the way. But this is a completely different kind of hymn. It's talking about the imparting of the gift of the Spirit daily. O thou who camest from above, the pure celestial fire to impart, kindle a flame of sacred love on the mean altar of my heart. Jesus, confirm my heart's desire to work and speak and think for thee. Still let me guard the holy fire and still stir up the gift in me. Ready for all thy perfect will, my acts of faith and love repeat, till death thy endless mercies seal and make my sacrifice complete.
perfect passage from this life to the next. And good to remember on this day when we commemorate his year's mind, 29th of March, 1788. So many more hymns we could, we could use from Charles Wesley. But let's go on to someone else who also died on this day. I'm talking about John Keeble, who died on March the 29th, 1866. Another hymn writer but very different from Charles Wesley, for as Charles Wesley was at the formation of a completely different and radical movement of the church, so he himself remained a, a priest of the Church of England through the whole of his days until his death and is buried in Marylebone churchyard. Um, John Keeble, uh, I mean the movement went on of course to form the Methodist Church, giving life to all kinds of new dimensions and now very much a communion with, with, with which we are in close fellowship. But um, John Keeble, on the other hand, was what they called a high churchman. And he and his father, who was also a priest, just followed out the dictates of the Book of Common Prayer and said their offices daily and, and uh, the old Mr. Keeble, John's father, looked after the parish there in Gloucestershire, this was Fairford. And Fairford Church is known for its multitude of wonderful stained glass. But we think of it as the place where John Keeble ministered. And he would also go over to the other parish when his father grew very old to minister there too. John Keeble could have had a, an, a life in Oxford because he was a, a great scholar and became a fellow of Oriel College, but he went home to be his father's curate and would on horseback go from their house in Fairford over to the parish and go under the trees and into the morning air and sometimes as he was visiting it the evenings and as he wrote, as he, as he rode rather, he wrote hymns in his mind. He wasn't thinking of them as hymns, he was thinking of them as poetry. And it came into his mind that to have a spiritual contemplation in rhythm, he would write one for every special day of the Christian year. Every Sunday, and every Saint's Day, and also hymns for baptism, confirmation, visitation of the sick, things mentioned in the Book of Common Prayer, morning and evening was morning prayer he was riding over to say. And if we think now um, of John Keeble, he was a, 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 an absolute uh, form, formative power in the Oxford movement, a different movement of discipline and regrowth in the church, fruitfulness of that kind. But he was someone who didn't like the centre stage. And the fact that on the 14th of July, 1833, he preached a sermon at what we now call a justice service, but was then called an assize service in the Church of St. Mary the Virgin in Oxford. And that sermon was seen as a trumpet call for the nation to wake up. It was a sermon on national apostasy, calling them to remember that the authority of the church came from Christ and not from the power of the state. But as far as John Keeble was concerned, this was some ordinary teaching that he and his father had always believed in, and he couldn't understand why it caused such a storm. He went back and became one of the formative people within the Oxford movement with John Henry Newman and uh, Edward Pusey. But Keeble was always, really, at heart, a country parish priest who, like the Good Shepherd, knew his folk and they knew him. And friends had to persuade him, first of all, to publish all the verses he'd written, and then to allow them to be sung. Right through his life, he retained that love of being simply a parish priest, knowing his people, not just knowing them in their spirit, but knowing the way they thought, each one of them, and knowing what their hands were good at doing, having an intuition and that sense which George Herbert had in earlier centuries of going around and talking to them over the garden gate, 
and speaking to them about their families and being there long enough for them to know that he had conducted their wedding, baptised their children, taught in the school, all of those things. And yet at the same time, his hymns became beloved by so many. And one of my absolute favourite hymns is his morning hymn, because it deals with our vocation, each of us following the way, the gift of this new day, given new every morning, well that's given the game away because that's the first line of the hymn, and taking that passage from, strangely, from the Book of Lamentations, and Keeble giving that real um, heart, and we'll read that hymn now, because to me it is a favourite prayer which I tend to know by heart and can say myself when I remember the tune, particularly, lovely tune called Melcombe, very simple tune. But here we are, John Keeble's Morning Hymn. New every morning is the love our wakening and uprising prove through sleep and darkness safely brought, restored to life and power and thought. New mercies each returning day hover around us while we pray. New perils past, new sins forgiven, new thoughts of God, new hopes of heaven. If on our daily course our mind be set to hallow all we find, New treasures still of countless price God will provide for sacrifice. Old friends, old scenes will lovelier be, as more of heaven in each we see. Some softening gleam of love and prayer shall dawn on every cross and care. We need not bid for cloistered cell, our neighbour and our work farewell nor strive to wind ourselves too high for sinful man beneath the sky. The trivial round, the common task, would furnish all we ought to ask. Room to deny ourselves, a road to bring us daily nearer God. Only, O Lord, in thy dear love, fit us for perfect rest above and help us this and every day to live more nearly as we pray. one of the best prayers of the morning and quite often because the tune helped me know it 
when I've been going along in the morning in the car, I've sung it as a, a hymn which reminds me that old friends can, through the gift of grace, give us new insights. Every day will give us new treasures in terms of the insights that heaven, given us, uh, heaven will give us. And the fact that each day restores, restores us to life and power and thought, there again is the total humanity being raised up to offer to God a new day, new sins forgiven, but off we go on that day. And where do we find the, the material for living out what God wants from us? Well, all around us, in the creation. But at the same time, that is driven with good decisions made by our thoughts, but an entry in our prayers to that world which is beyond. All there in Keeble's hymn. And uh, it's, the, it's the, the trivial round, the common task, will furnish all we ought to ask, very much like Herbert's hymn, who sweeps a room as for thy laws, makes that and the action fine. So let's say our prayers on this particular day, sitting under the ash tree, and uh, we're praying on this day, the 29th of March, for the Diocese of Koforidua in the Church of the Province of West Africa, the Ghana Province, and in this diocese for Archbishop Justin, for Rose, Bishop of Dover, for Emma, Bishop at Lambeth, and the Parish Church of St. Paul at Maidstone, for Chris Lavender and Anthea Mitchell in their ministry there, <clears throat> and the whole life of that parish. Pray for your own communities of faith wherever you are in the world. And <clears throat> we will use the collect for today and then the collect for Lent. Bring your own prayers and intentions. <clears throat> Merciful Lord, absolve your people from their offences that through your bountiful goodness we may all be delivered from the chains of those sins which by our frailty we have committed. Grant this, Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our blessed Lord and Saviour. And the Collect for Lent. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing that you have made and forgive the sins of all those who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may receive from you the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So here we say, each in our own language, the prayer our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. So we're going to have a moment of reflection now, but during that reflection, we have some music from an ex-chorister of ours who will be known to you. His name is Ben Priest, and you've seen him conducting not only the services in the cathedral when our own choir are away, but at the same time, um, we've seen him uh, conducting his own school choir at the um, Duke of York's Royal Military Academy in Dover. And this morning he's conducting his voluntary choir, Caritas, who often sing for us here, in a folk song, a beautiful folk song. So often folk songs have a sadness, but also are of the countryside, of where they come from. And that's so in any culture. And this folk song is called The Ash Grove. I'll just read you the first verse. Down yonder green valley, where streamlets meander, when twilight is fading, I pensively move, or at the bright noontide in solitude wander, amid the dark shades of the lonely ash grove. Twas there while the blackbird was cheerfully singing, I first met that dear one, the joy of my heart, and near us, for gladness, the bluebells were ringing, are then little sought I 
how soon we should part. So many of these songs have sadnesses in them as well as joy, but the way in which the Creator's gifts around us can help us be poetic or thoughtful or pray with the gifts God has given us is absolutely evident. So sitting under the ash tree this morning, we say our prayers.
Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow him, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you, upon those whom you love, and those whom you would pray for, now and always. Amen. So, as we go through the day, let's not only remember the presence of the Good Shepherd who knows us absolutely by name and calls us as his own, but also Keeble's lines, the trivial round, the common task, will furnish all we need to ask and probably you're asking for a little breakfast at this point as well, do you think? <laughs>